I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. The following presentation is brought to you by Nature. Nature. Not a VPN, not a razor or a shave club, not a soap for men or a subscription to stuff you don't want. Nature. Always there. Always free. Always a tree. Always useful. Always available. Never sells out. Scream and shout. Nature. The only brand you need. Available in all 50 states. For now. Limited supply available. Act now before it's gone. You don't want to miss this. So what's your nature? Trademarked by Earth. Thanks for coming to Purpose Channel, yo! Yeah. If you could know the secrets of the universe, the secrets of creation, and the purpose of existence, would you? In other words, if you had the opportunity to get a full, let's say, download of all the universal information that you could possibly want regarding human nature, history, as well as the future, is that something that you would be interested in? I know a lot of people out there who uh, have claimed that they can do exactly this, that they can either um, connect with aliens or channel ancient entities or people who have passed, as well as predict the future, look to where human humankind is going. And uh, let's just say I have my doubts on both accounts, but uh, I'm posing this question because I, I find it fascinating how few people ha seem to have really thought it through. And I can see this very apparent in the fact that so many people go to psychics. Now, I don't want to offend anyone here, or um, especially anyone who's spent money going to a psychic, nor anybody who believes that they are a psychic. And I do believe that there may be some connections that we have within our minds to one another. But as far as a person giving a person a horoscope or predicting their future based on their charts, I don't buy any of it. And uh, the part of it that fascinates me the most is that people want to know. And I ask myself, why? What is it that they want to know about their future and why? So I'm going to, I guess, just leave it there, but I'd like to add this into a video where I'm going to read out of a book. It's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It's by Manley P. Hall. It's a fairly long book. It's almost a century old. It was written in 1928. And during the midsection of the book, there are several, let's just say, very detailed colored drawings which illustrate people's conception and interpretation of the ether or the unknown, whether it be the layers of existence or the layers of heaven or God, as well as um, there were many discussions about things like the tarot, the tarot deck, I have a book called The Tarot of the Bohemians, I might read one time, and it's a wild ride, but let's just say I do believe that there's something to it. I'm not one of those people who dismisses it all outright. Um, I actually have several books regarding these subjects, and the reason I'm talking about it is because I feel like it's important to dispel some of the myths that there's really a secret knowledge that you can obtain where you will understand the universe and that that will make your life better. And there's the key right there. There are things you can learn that may resonate with you about the history and maybe even your future. But the question is, why do you want to know that? And do you really want to know it? Because once you've learned something, you can't unlearn it. And it doesn't mean you're smarter or better off. So, with that said, I'm going to read out of this book and uh, feel free to let me know what you think at the end and I will talk to you all later. Today we are going to be reading from The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly Hall. 
tap, tap, tap. That's so I can align my recording with the actual video. Since the GoPro I'm using to record doesn't have the same quality of audio, I'm doing a separate audio recording to add along with it. So this is the first relief, the first picture. Many of these ancient depictions are maybe not ancient, but they are hundreds of years old, and some of them are very, very metaphoric. And in today's world, we are told you can't make a depiction of Muhammad. However, this is exactly how this one first starts out. Now, this book was written in 1928 by Manly P. Hall, and uh, it's almost 100 years old, and it has a lot of fascinating information in it. And I'm just going to be reading from the reliefs in the center. So, as for the first picture, it reads, At the left of the plate stands Muhammad, holding aloft pages from the Quran, his left foot upon an image which he has overthrown. Behind Muhammad, the celestial bull, signifying the constellation of Taurus, opens the egg of the year with his horns. At the lower right is a bas-relief of the Persian sun god, Mithras, in an attitude signifying the conquest of the sun over the celestial bull at the ancient vernal equinox. In the center stands the high priest of Israel, his right arm encircling the base of the seven-branched candlestick, the mosaic symbol of the planetary governors of the world. To his right is the statue of the golden calf, and to his left, the robed figures of the Greek mystics, bearing a tripod, in which burns the sacrificial fire. Behind the bull Apis, crowned with the lunar globe, and Father Nile, bearing the horn of plenty, and pouring the waters of life from his urn, loom the pyramids, the great Egyptian temples of initiation. In the clouds at the left, is the seated figure of Jupiter, Jupiter Amon, brandishing a flaming thunderbolt and a horn to signify that he partakes in the attributes of the zodiacal ram. In the heavens appears the mystery of the apocalypse. The four creatures of Ezekiel's vision surround an altar upon which is the book of seven seals and the Lamb of God. At the upper left is the band of the zodiac, the constellation of Taurus, Aries, and Pisces represent the stellar influences which, according to the ancients, descending upon the earth, are responsible for the establishment of the religious and philosophical institutions herein set forth. My God, that is complicated language, my friends. My apologies in advance, but that's why I'm reading it for you, because many people won't read this. And it's pretty fascinating stuff. Moving on. The second picture is called An Initiation Ceremony in the Eleusinian Mysteries. And it reads, The candidate and his aged initiator are here shown standing on the brink of a chasm, dividing the world of the living from that of the dead, and through which streams the shade of the departed. On the farther side of the chasm, Hades, the god of the underworld, sits on his golden throne, surrounded by the emblems of death, and attended by Cerberus, the three-headed dog guardian of the gates of death. Above the yawning cleft hover hovers the fi figure of Ceres, carrying the two torches which light her way through the gloom of the netherworld. She pleads for the liberation of her daughter, Persephone, whom Hades has abducted and would force to become his queen. John A. Weiss thus describes the ritual of the Eleusinia. Soon the thunder rolled, lightning flashed, strange and fearful objects appeared, and the place seemed to shake and be on fire. Hideous specters glided through the building, moaning and sighing. Frightful noises and howlings were heard. Mysterious apparitions, representing the messengers of the infernal deities, anguish, madness, 
famine, disease, and death flew around. As the trembling crowd of novices advanced amid this fearful spectacle, representing the torments of this life and those of Tartarus, they heard the solemn voice of the Hierophant explaining them and exhibiting his symbols of supreme deity, which but added to the horrors of the scene, when suddenly a serene light and objects of bliss appeared, and opened an Elysium, the initiated Eleusinian phalanx, who had, in short time and space, experienced the miseries of earth, the torture of Tartarus, and the happiness of Elysium. That shit's deep. <laughs> Moving on to the next. Hermes, as the personification of the universal wisdom, is here depicted with his foot upon the back of Typhon, the vanquished dragon of ignorance and perversion. To the Egyptian initiates, Typhon, the devourer of souls, signified the lower world which swallows up the spiritual nature of the individual, who, being imperfect, is forced to descend from the higher spheres and be reborn into the physical universe. To be swallowed by Typhon, therefore, signifies the process of rebirth, from which man can only release himself by vanquishing his mortal adversary. In one hand, Hermes carries the caduceus, a winged rod with two fighting serpents entwined about it. In the other, the immortal emerald, upon whose surface was inscribed in raised letters the sum of philosophy. The figure wears the ancient Egyptian Masonic apron, according to the pattern discovered by Belzoni, the eminent Egyptologist. The two small circles contain the forms and symbols most closely associated with Hermes. In the upper circle is the ibis, whose curious characteristics have caused it to be particularly associated with the medical art. In the initiation ceremonies of the Egyptian priests wore masks in the form of ibis heads to signify that they represented the attributes of Thoth, or Hermes. The lower circle contains the dog, an animal represented by the attributes of Thoth, or Hermes. Whoops. The lower circle contains the dog, an animal always associated with Hermes because of its intelligence and devotion. Upon the forehead of Hermes appears the Uraeus, the secret symbol of the constellation of Scorpio, which represents the regeneration of the same power that in the form of a dragon lies helpless under his foot. The scarab over the heart of Hermes represents the presence of spiritual and regenerative light within his own soul. The collar typifies by its circles the orbits of the heavenly bodies. The three points of the tail of Typhon, which end in arrows, indicate the three destructive expressions of universal energy, mental, moral, and physical perversion. The entire diagram signifies mastery through the regeneration of the body, the illumination of the mind, and the transmutation of the emotions. I am Isis, mistress of the whole land. I was instructed by Hermes, and with Hermes I invented the writings of the nations. In order that not all shall write with the same letters, I gave mankind their laws and ordained what no one can alter. I am the eldest daughter of Kronos. I am the wife and sister of the King Osiris. I am she who rises in the dog star. I am she who is called the goddess of women. I am she who separated the heaven from the earth. I have pointed out their paths to the stars. I have invented seamanship. I have brought together men and women. I have ordained that the elders shall be beloved by the children. With my brother Osiris, I made an end of cannibalism. I have instructed mankind in the mysteries. 
I have taught reverence of the divine statues. I have established the temple precincts. I have overthrown the dominion of the tyrants. I have caused men to love women. I have made justice more powerful than silver and gold. I have caused truth to be considered beautiful. The face and form of Isis were covered with a veil of scarlet cloth, symbolic of ignorance and emotionalism, which forever stand between man and truth. Isis lifts her veil and discovers herself to the true and wise investigator, who unselfishly, humbly, and earnestly seeks to understand the mysteries which surround him in the universe. Those to whom she reveals herself are warned to remain silent concerning the mysteries which they have seen. The great admonition of the wise men was, if you know it, be silent. To the vulgar and profane, the infidel and disinterested one, she does not uncover her face, for they got, knew, could not understand the secret processes of the invisible worlds. This next one is called Con Consulting the Oracle of Delphi. While the tripod and its base, as here shown, differ from the description of several authors, an attempt has been made to follow as closely as possible the symbolism concealed within the allegory of the oracle. The Delphic mysteries use the oracle as their chief symbol, and it is the spiritual and esoteric mystery rather than the historical and consequently unimportant aspect with which the student of symbolism is interested. While the spirit inhabiting the fumes which rose continuously from the fissure entered into the body of the priestess, the tripod vibrated as though struck severe and repeated blows. Loud clangings were heard which echoed through the cavern. The din increased as the control of the demon over the priestess became more complete, and the rattling and crashing did not cease until the spirit released its hold upon Pythia. The three legs of the tripod symbolized the three periods of time controlled by Apollo, namely the past, the present, and the future. The space enclosed by the legs of the tripod forms the sacred Pythagorean tetrahedron, with the prophetess seated upon the legs of the tripod, uh, seated upon its apex. As the priestess of Delphi is held aloft over the abyss of the oracle, supported by only three slender legs and ending in claws, so the spiritual nature of man is suspended over the abyss of oblivion by three golden threads of divine power. The face of Apollo appears on the tripod, and around the base are coiled serpents to symbolize Python whose decaying body lies beneath the Delphic Shrine. The last ones I'm going to read, the first one's called The Hand of the Mysteries. The original drawing from which this plate was taken is designated the hand of the philosopher which is extended to those who enter the mysteries. When the disciple of the great art first beholds this hand, it is closed, and he must discover a method of opening it before the mystery contained therein may be revealed. In alchemy, the hand signifies the formula for the preparation of the tincture physicorum. The fish is mercury, and the flame-bounded sea which it swims is sulfur. While each of the fingers bears the emblem of a divine agent through the combined operations of which the great work is accomplished. The unknown artist says of the diagram, the wise take their oath by this hand that they will not teach the art without parables. To the Kabbalist, the figure signifies the operation of the one power, the crowned thumb, in the four worlds, the fingers of their emblems. Besides its alchemical and Kabbalistic meaning, the figures symbolize the hand of a master mason, 
with which he raises the martyr builder of the divine house. Philosophically, the key represents the mysteries themselves, without whose aid man cannot unlock the numerous chambers of his own being. The lantern is human knowledge, for it is a spark of the universal fire captured in a man-made vessel. It is the light of those who dwell in the inferior universe, and with the aid of which they seek to follow in the footsteps of truth. The sun, which may be termed the light of the world, represents the luminescence of creation, through which the man may learn the mystery of all creatures which express through truth and form. The star is the universal light, which reveals cosmic and celestial verities. The crown is absolute light, unknown and unrevealed, whose power shines through all the lesser lights that are but sparks of this eternal effulgence. Thus is set forth the right hand or active principle of deity, whose work are all contained within the hollow of his hand. So I'm going to leave it there, and uh, I appreciate you all coming along. I'll be reading more in the future. If you enjoy it, let me know, and uh, I'll definitely do more of it. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and uh, be well, my friends. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed, for what it's worth. I'm recording this outro before I even record the video, so therefore I don't even know if I will be uploading this or how it will turn out. But if I ended up combining the first video along with the second video, then this video, and actually took the time to upload it, it must be decent enough. And uh, I wanted to say thank you to my patrons. I have a few new patrons and um, I don't have the names in front of me, but I'll post them at the end here. And I also have a, um, a great big thank you to those who donated last night on the live stream. It was a very unexpected bonus, and I really appreciate it. You know, times are hard for a lot of us. I realize that every contribution comes out of someone else's pocket, and I don't take that for granted. Hopefully here in the near future, I'll set something up where I'd like to do a monthly drawing and send one of my patrons something, you know, as a thank you. All my patrons, for that matter, but we'll talk further about that in the future. Be well. Do me a favor. Think over what you really think you need to know and want to know. And then completely forget about it and go give someone a hug because a hug is going to give you much more satisfaction than any prediction from the future. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Thanks for coming to Carbo's channel, yo.